It is Friday, March 27th. Let's talk PlayStation. Starting off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder, the March games that are currently available, Sonic Forces and Shadow of the Colossus, you got a little bit of time left, although, interestingly, the PlayStation Access YouTube channel has leaked the games for April, so we know that it's Uncharted 4 and Dirt Rally 2.0 which a fine month, although Uncharted 4 is so popular that a lot of people have probably already played it. Although we've we've had Uncharted the Nathan Drake collection, now we're getting Uncharted 4. We're all home right now, so if you haven't played this franchise, maybe now is your time to do it. Although that's a good segue to our first news story, which is we are all home right now, and thus Sony is joining forces with many other services this past week that have announced they are slowing download speeds uh, to combat not only the network load on their own services, but also ISPs. So uh, with PlayStation Network uh, in the US and Europe, your gameplay is fine, you can play online, that'll be robust, no lag, assuming you have a good connection at home. But uh, your downloads may actually be throttled a little bit. Uh, Sony didn't say how much, but uh, that's that's what you could expect right now as we are all home right now because of COVID-19. Now, as another little reminder, this weekend is going to be a trial period for Predator Hunting Grounds. Some people forget this game actually exists and that it's Sony funded, Sony published, coming to PS4 and PC in April. Asynchronous multiplayer, you can either be the Predator and hunt a squadron of players, or you can be the squadron of players trying to take down the Predator. It's an interesting, you know, multiplayer format. It works for some games, not for others. But if you're a PS Plus member, you can try this free trial this weekend and see if it's something that you might potentially dig. Now, before we go over our main cover story, let's go over some updates. This one we've been following for quite a while. Remedy Entertainment, Sony possibly acquiring them or doing a second party exclusive. We always thought something was going on there. That is officially off the table. Epic Games has announced a new publishing label where they will actually uh, fund projects release them. There's a whole deal in place. The terms are actually pretty favorable right now. Uh, and they have announced that the, the first three developers to sign on to this publishing label will be Remedy, uh, Gen Design, and uh, Play Dead. So very interesting. And I think it's important to actually go over the terms that Epic is offering as a publishing label. So the three main principles that developers will retain 100% of their intellectual property, full creative control. They will cover 100% of development costs from developer salaries to go-to market expenses, such as QA, localization, marketing, all publishing costs. Developers earn a fair share of their work. Once the costs are recouped, developers earn at least 50% of all profits. Now, I know that last point, some people might get hung up on that. Keep in mind, the amount of what they're doing prior to this, covering 100% of development costs, and most prominently, they keep the IP. That's always the sticking point with a lot of game development, is that in order to find a publisher, you have to hand over the IP. That's kind of a big thing, especially with some of these bigger developers that are getting into AA or AAA. Remedy's one of them. Uh, they're one of those developers like many where they face that reality or if they want to get a publisher, if they work with a hardware manufacturer, Sony's going to want the IP, somebody's going to want the IP. So the fact that Epic is offering complete creative control, 100% IP rights, um, you know, in exchange for, uh, you know, what might what might seem very unfavorable in the end game where a game comes out, does really well, then they start seeing 50% profit share. The fact that they keep their IP means any subsequent sequel they could do on their own. They can explore other monetization efforts like DLC or merchandise. There's a lot of ways that this can get leveraged. And uh, as much as people hate Epic, it doesn't guarantee that it's an Epic Game Store exclusive or anything like that. There's a lot of uh, things left to interpretation, right? Like up to a 50% revenue share, up to 100% development cost covered. Uh, they specifically state it could be multi-platform. So it's very discretionary. It's a deal by deal case, I'd imagine. So a lot of these games we can still expect on PlayStation 5 in the future, PC and Xbox. Seeing Gen Design on there, also interesting. That's Fumita Ueda's team that was uh, formed in 2014 to help finish The Last Guardian. So now we're going to see a Fumita Ueda title that's actually going to be available <laughs> on different platforms. Yeah, Epic has laid out a very, a very convincing deal to a lot of teams. And uh, if anything, I'd say it actually heats up the, the room a little bit in terms of studio acquisitions for not only Sony, but also Microsoft. When you have this suite of a publishing deal, uh, a lot of mid-tier and smaller teams can definitely go here before they go to a manufacturer. Now, we also got an update on the Silent Hill rumor. Uh, Konami possibly doing a soft reboot of the franchise, bringing Silent Hills back from 2014. Uh, well, uh, Reliant Horror reached out to Konami's uh, PR in the U.S. and they actually got a response back within an hour. And Konami claimed that they are well aware of the rumors, but there is no active development for the Silent Hills franchise, although they're not entirely ruling anything out in terms of how Silent Hill can be brought back. 
So at face value, I'm sure many people can look at that and go, okay, the rumors were false. Um, although to be fair, that's certainly not something that you can just totally believe because a publisher is going to want to announce a game on their terms. If they're, if they're doing something, they're not going to just confirm it in this, uh, very easy general PR statement, right? They're not going to just say, yes, we have a new game and here's what's called. Uh, sure, they could say something like, yes, we're currently exploring how to bring the franchise back or, or be more open-ended about how that something is happening, but they're not ready to talk about it. But um, I'm still on the fence of thinking that there is something going on that they don't want to reveal just yet. It depends on how they want to answer it. And uh, we've got a myriad of examples of where a publisher straight up lied to press because they want to be able to surprise people or release a teaser trailer or announce something at a conference or, you know, they're not totally sure where the project's going just yet. So they don't want to, you know, release anything too soon, like PT, for example. So uh, I wouldn't lay this one completely to rest just yet. Next up, we have an update on PS5 backwards compatibility. I felt it would be important to briefly go over this. Uh, if you didn't see my video on Monday about everything we know about PS5 or my tweet or the community post, or if you just didn't see the news, Sony confirmed that uh, PlayStation 5 backwards compatibility with PS4 games is the vast majority of its library, not 100 games, not on a rolling basis, most games. Unfortunately, my interpretation on LTPS last week was dead wrong, which sucks because when I saw Road to PS5, I thought, okay, it's most games. Then the PlayStation blog worded it much differently, and that's where I thought, wow, maybe it isn't. Maybe they're not doing backwards compatibility as seriously as Microsoft. Um, so that's kind of what made me rethink that. And then I was op uh, not optimistic, pessimistic that they wouldn't clarify their statement. Thankfully, they did, and uh, it will be the vast majority of games. And ironically, people were confused about the PlayStation blog post, but then the update, they're even getting that wrong. So here's what's actually happening. Uh, Sony explains that they're testing PS4 games with boosted frequencies to see what, what happens. They're not adding a boosted frequency to PS4 games. PS5 retroactively does that. In certain examples, faster load times, but also if it's an unlocked frame rate, you get a higher frame rate. If games aren't hard-coded with certain aspects of like level of detail, or say if you're driving too fast in GTA 5 and you hit an invisible building because it didn't load in, right? Pop-in could be reduced. You know, these are things that could retroactively happen with no developer intervention. But because PS5 is so fast, some games experience compatibility issues. So Mark Cerny tested the top 100 games to see what the boosted frequency does. If it messes up a game, that's where they either play the game in a, ba a base legacy setting, how it plays on a PS4 or a PS4 Pro, or they'll you know contact the developer and see if they can if they can do something on their end to make sure that the game works properly on PlayStation 5. But otherwise, most games are supposed to play just fine. That's what's actually happening. So I'm thankful that we have a clarification. For those that want to talk about PS1, 2, 3, please watch my video on Monday. Go to the go to about eight minutes in. There's an explanation there. I've beaten that topic to death in regards to why PS1, 2, and 3 are unlikely and why it's such a misunderstood topic, but Go there for that explanation, we're not going to do that again. Now moving on, we have a minor update to Death Stranding. The game is getting a photo mode on the PC version this summer, which left PS4 players wondering, where's our photo mode? Well, Kojima did finally confirm that a photo mode will be coming to PS4 very soon. We don't know how long, but there you go. That feature is coming to PlayStation 4, which I'm actually surprised it wasn't there to begin with because it's a very photogenic game. Now on to the Final Fantasy VII Remake. We finally got perhaps the best explanation so far of why this game is multiple parts because for years we've been told the game's too big, it's too big, it needs multiple parts, it's just too big. But uh, the producer Yoshinori Katase finally elaborated a little bit further about how they approach this. Before they started production, they were given two options. Uh, either make one game, but you just can't be as ambitious as you want. You might have to remove certain aspects. You can't go crazy with visual fidelity and things like that. Or you do multiple parts and you can do all those things I just described. You can go crazy. You can add new features, new gameplay mechanics, things like that. And that's what they did. So first off, that's not entirely inaccurate to say that they'd have to remove things. In fact, this is very typical in game development. It's kind of a developer's worst nightmare, uh, an artist's worst nightmare. If they work on this gameplay mechanic or build all these assets or, you know, artist drafts up all these pictures for a level and then it gets thrown away. Happens all the time. So it's not necessarily Square Enix being super greedy. They want to just, you know, leech every dollar out of you, right? It's totally reasonable to expect a big game back then would be quite an undertaking to bring to today's standards. But my concern is that the first game is just Midgar, which is like five, six hours of the original game. So what is the what does the roadmap look like for trying to release this thing in its entirety? How long is it going to take, even with faster turnaround because of 
assets already being built, mechanics already being built, it still just seems like this is going to be much longer than it actually needs to be. Like two, potentially three games would have made sense. But if you're going off of five hours with Midgar and you try to extrapolate that for the rest of it, we're looking at way more than a few parts, right? So that's, you know, that's what, what kind of rubs me the wrong way, I guess. I guess we'll see how that plays out. Now, this past week, we had a lot of interesting developer reactions and comments about PlayStation 5, which is always important to go over because these are the people making your games. It's always fun to, you know, compare specs and talk about performance differences and what we could see in next-gen games. It's totally fine, but obviously it snowballs and it gets into the fanboy territory and people not knowing what they're talking about. And for as long as I can tell you on this show, that hey, the SSDs are what's really important. Teraflops doesn't tell you everything about a platform's performance. It's more about APIs, SDK advancement, things like that. For as long as I can say those things, if you've been watching this channel for a while, it's much more important you hear it from developers. So uh, for example, over on Reset Era, we had one comment from uh, Jason Insider. He's a developer at Breakfall. He made a post responding to somebody asking about um, Series X and PS5 SSD IO differences. And uh, he explained, He's not sure about a major difference, but he uh, notes, the SSDs are the game changer this generation. A fast drive is the thing I'd want more than anything. He'd give up GPU power for a faster drive any day. The faster, the better. He says the Xbox drive seems fast, although not enough to start dreaming wildly, whereas the PS5 drive with the framework and infrastructure around it is fast enough for him to design with zero drive bottlenecks. Then we have another post from Kowalski. He's an independent developer working on a smaller scale VR title. Uh, that's very intensive on hardware. He says there's a lot of complex things going on in his game. He's more excited personally for PS5 because of the SSD and IO speeds and VR opportunities. He says he designed his game with SATA 3 SSD performance uh, to be seamless, no loading screens, to be streamlined and runtime without any hitches. Then we ported the game to Xbox One to get a playable build. That of course, an HDD, 5400 RPM drive. That's where there were major problems with his, net, with his uh, game. He basically had to cut back and redesign a lot of certain aspects of it. So that's what we've been talking about for quite a while now. But uh, he goes on to say that he has a friend who's a AAA developer for a big publisher. And uh, he asked them about the differences in the dev kits between both consoles. He said, my friend just shows me this pose regarding the power difference in favor of the Series X. Basically saying that it's in favor of Series X, but it's not nearly as large. Now I showed these two first because they actually paint a better picture of what Matt Phillips is saying uh, on his write-up, uh, which he called Teraflops versus Performance, the difficulties of comparing video game consoles. It's an incredible write-up. I'm gonna link this down below. He's been a programmer for 15 years, shipped 24 games under his belt, uh, all of various sizes, different platforms. So uh, I'm gonna just highlight a few key things here that paint a broader spectrum of what I've been saying for a while, but also what these developers have said. He says, a quick look back at PS1, Saturn versus 64, Xbox GameCube, PS2, 360 versus PS3, Xbox One versus PS4, shows countless examples of cross-platform games that should have run faster on one particular system when looking at the specs alone, but the benchmarks proved otherwise. If one system is of an entirely different architecture or contains helpful hardware that another doesn't, this may mean whole sections of optimizations are specialized and can't be ported across to another machine. For a first party developer, this is a non-issue, but that also throws comparisons out the window. So which computer would give the highest FPS in a game? One with a two teraflop processor or one with a 2.2 teraflop processor? Now we need to look at different clock speeds, bus bandwidth, cache sizes, register counts, main and video RAM sizes, access latencies, core counts, Northbridge implementation, firmwares, drivers, operating systems, graphic APIs, shader languages, compiler optimizations, overall engine architecture, data formats, and hundreds, maybe thousands of other factors. The Wii U was an interesting machine, and its first party titles made exceptional use of its touchscreen controller, but it was common to see cross-platform titles phoning it in with a quick minimap. Maintaining a specialized version of a game suited to just one machine usually isn't worth the time or effort of the team needed to design, maintain, QA, and bug fix those features. So I wanted to include these comments because they paint a broad spectrum of how most developers work and feel about these platforms, which yes, Series X looks quite good on a number of fronts over PlayStation 5, but there's just been time and time again many examples where a third party, because of certain optimizations, because of certain prioritizations, uh, and a lot of unknown aspects of game development just cause one particular version to run, look, or play better than another one that on paper should be uh, the one that produces the better looking game, right? I mean, that's just, it just happens all the time. 
And that's actually why Digital Foundry often has many uh, examples and videos on record of uh, situations where a PlayStation 4 game doesn't run nearly as well as the Xbox One version or a PS4 Pro game might run a little bit better than the Series X version. It just happens. The other example is uh, Wii U. Uh, this is what I talk about a lot when it comes to specialized peripherals or um, these gimmicky things that Sony will put on the controller. Microsoft tries to shoehorn in with Kinect where it might initially be used by only first parties, but that will be the only place where you'll see it because they only have to code and make for that platform, whereas a third party cannot go the extra mile. That's the unfortunate reality of PlayStation 5's SSD. As incredibly fast as it is, uh, the minimum is the speeds on Series X. So the only people that are really going to take advantage of it uh, potentially are Sony's first party. But at the very least, what I've been conveying for a little bit now is developers are so pumped that the SSD is the minimum. So it's great that Series X also has one because at the very least, that will open up a lot of uh, qualitative aspects to uh, game design that uh, may not even potentially most people will really even notice, but it's something that they can do on their end, which frees up a lot of their creative process. Next up, we have a recent patent filed by Sony Interactive Entertainment, and this one kind of uh, tells us what we already knew about the PS5 UI, where we read in the Wired articles about how the PS5 UI will present uh, certain activities in that game so you don't even have to start the game to find out what's going on in the game. This patent is for dynamic interfaces for launching direct gameplay. So what the patent basically describes is that it's creating a template uh, in the SDK so that uh, a developer can program certain uh, actions from the game to be presented in the UI, right? That's kind of what, it, what it's explaining more or less. And uh, this is exactly what we heard in the Wired stuff where uh, a multiplayer game can show you certain lobbies or playlists that you can jump right into, right? Like we're pretty much eliminating the startup screens where you go through a set of logos, you press start, you go to multiplayer, you hit find lobbies. All that's getting removed to where just from the UI, you can say, okay, I love playing Team Deathmatch. You hit Team Deathmatch in the UI, and in theory, you're taken directly to that as quickly as possible. We all know Sony keeps talking about how fast this SSD is and how quickly they want you to boot your game in about a second, which uh, is an interesting parallel to basically another news story where Jason Schreier on Recent Era gave us some insight on what he's hearing about PlayStation 5 and how Sony wants to convey just how quick this thing is and how um, easy it is to use your, your PS5. And he's basically describing it as Netflix where he says, I've heard some fascinating things about PS5's operating system like this. One of the pitches they've been making to developers is playing PS5 games should be as easy as Netflix. They want to make players feel like they can load up the game immediately and know exactly how much time a given activity is going to take them. They want people to feel more inclined to play in short bursts rather than only wanting to turn on consoles when they have a few hours to spare. I feel like this pitch was almost made exactly for me because I'm one of those people where I feel obligated to have five, six hours to play a game, and if I don't, I'm, I'm not going to play a game. Otherwise, I try to play smaller stuff to feel like I'm getting a lot done. I know that's just kind of a weird way for me to approach games, but I just don't have time that much nowadays. Uh, but either way, that's besides the point. What he's describing, though, um, pretty much goes into this pattern, pretty much goes into what we've been hearing about before. So this UI really is going to be centered around getting to your content as quickly as possible, eliminating all these uh, unnecessary screens that uh, kind of keep us away from everything. Microsoft even had a great demo showcasing how you can uh, you can do different save states for your game. You can transfer into this game, hop into this game, and it only took a few seconds in between those titles. Now, if Sony really wants to go balls to the wall crazy with their SSD, then it might be even faster than that to where it's just maybe one to two seconds to swap from one title to the other, maybe swap from a game to Netflix. And again, you're, you're cutting so many corners to where you can just see in a single player game, oh, this is exactly where I am in this game. It might show a screenshot of exactly where you last saved your game. It might say current objective. This is what you are working on. Three out of four. Like these are the kind of uh, templates that could be presented to developers and this is what could be implemented into the PS5 UI and I think this is something that they're really trying to convey which is they want this thing to be accessible easy and very quick now next up are you a creator on dreams well if you are then don't you dare make any Nintendo content because Nintendo is sending a cease and desist to Sony on any content made in dreams that uh infringes on Nintendo's intellectual property. So basically anything that uh, is Mario or Nintendo-like in Dreams is being taken down. 
Uh, so that's, I mean, it's, who didn't see that coming though, right? I mean, Nintendo safeguards their IP very closely to their chest. Any sort of modification, somebody building something in Unreal Engine, releasing something online, even if it's not for profit, commercial gain, nothing like, they don't, they don't care. They will take it down if they find you. And now that this has been sent over to Sony, I'm going to imagine that Sony and Media Molecule pretty much have to mandate this retroactively now where if anything Nintendo related is shared on Dreams, they'll have a system that catches it and takes it down. So you can make it in your own personal time on your console, but, but you can't share it anymore. So keep that in mind. Now let's get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you could win a $10 PSN code. I'd like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PlayStation Network code, it's very simple. Follow the link down below to the Gleam website, support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week. I am trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about you all. On Monday, we did PS5, everything we know so far. All the facts rounded up and backwards compatibility, so go watch that for a greater understanding on that topic. On Wednesday, we did PS Vita Online 2020. Predictable results, but watch me play some Vita games, try to find some active communities. Vita's not dead yet. I still love that platform. I'm sure many of you do. Uh, we got more Vita content coming too over the uh, next coming months. But uh, this Tuesday, I actually know what the video is because I got it done in time. I know, a rare occasion for me, but we're reviewing more PS4 accessories. We did some from Wish, we did some from eBay. We're testing a new website. Tune in this Tuesday to find out uh, what they are and where they're from. And that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.